Hello, welcome also from my side um, for this webinar on the smart city um, and the openness of the smart city. city um, to, pre to, to present myself, uh, I'm leading globally the road and street segment in Philips Lighting. So I'm dealing with all our intelligent systems uh, to manage uh, road and street lighting, but also city lighting. And in many discussions with our customers uh, around smart city, which is for us a very important topic as uh, we are contributing with lighting a very important vertical to it, all the customers are always mentioning the openness. And so that's why uh, we uh, wanted to ask uh, Machina Research, which is one of the leading analyzing and consulting companies in the IoT area, we wanted to ask them to perform a research study for us in looking especially between uh, on the correlation between open systems and enablement of smart cities, so to find out the importance of open systems for smart cities. And Jeremy Green, as a principal analyst at Machina Research, he was leading this study. And I will now hand over to Jeremy, who will explain you the study and all the outcome of the study. And, and after he has finished, I will also come back and speak more about, about our systems. So, uh, Jeremy, I will now uh, hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. So, I'll move to the first slide. So, uh, as Peter has explained, the research is sponsored by Philips uh, to examine the value of open city systems as key enabler of smart cities. And we, Machina Research, a specialist analyst and consulting company focused on the IoT, carried out the research. And we did the research by interviewing cities, but also telecom operators and other suppliers and governments and NGOs, all of them active in the smart city space. And what we focused on were the implications and the challenges of openness, uh, both in terms of the connectivity and the interfaces between applications, interfaces between verticals, uh, how standards and procurement worked in this context. And to, um, to jump to the end, if you like, the, the conclusion of the research was the value of an open ecosystem that can develop it independently, but integrate at higher levels to allow uh, increasing value over time from different verticals and applications. So, um, it's conventional to begin with a definition of what, it, what a smart city is, but it's not straightforward to do that. <coughs> there is no single definition that everybody agrees to. There's no single architecture. Not everybody agrees what the applications are. There are very different visions, um, and there is a, there's kind of a continuum, which we'll come back to in a minute, between uh, a very uh, technical, uh, top-down version of a smart city, which is all about instrumenting uh, infrastructure and processes, and uh, a very sort of uh, touchy-feely version of smart city, which is about having happy, enabled citizens with much less focus on the technology. So down at the bottom of the slide, which I hope you can see, we've pasted in a definition from the ITUT focus group on smart sustainable cities. It's not a perfect definition by any means, but it's quite a good one. And over on the right hand side of the diagram, we've done, if you like, a, a thematic representation, a, a sort of a very high level model of what a smart city looks like. So in the center, we have the guts of the, the smart city, the uh, applications, the infrastructure, and uh, some kind of open data portal or, or open data system. And round the edges, we, we, we talk about, we think of all the potential users of that infrastructure. So uh, not only the agencies of the municipality itself, but also the businesses that are based in the city the citizens who live in this and work in the city and other civil society organizations, NGOs, and all of those should be able to both contribute and access and make use of the data that is, that is collected via that infrastructure and to be able to drive those applications. Um, on the next slide, 
uh, you see an attempt that we've made to represent the the applications of the smart city. Once again, there's no definitive set of applications, things that every smart city always includes, uh, <coughs> and that's because no two cities are alike. They they all have different um, uh, government structures and they all have different responsibilities. So in um, it's very common that the uh, the municipality is responsible for the lighting and the waste and parking and traffic, but that's not always the case. And on the other hand, sometimes the municipality is responsible for water or for air quality or social care or the police force. In, in other case, places, that's done by a private company or it's done by a different government agency that isn't municipally based. But on, on top of those uh, like conventional IoT type applications, that, that there's a, a layer of citizen facing applications uh, that's effectively CRM for the city, but it's also data publishing, it's also uh, social engagement applications like uh, if you're if you're familiar with it, fix my street that lets citizens report uh, um, broken pavements or uh, broken street lights or broken anything in their city um, and then outside that you can think of the uh, the, the open data portal or uh, experiments that are taking place in participatory budget budgeting or open sensing including sensing via smartphones or all those applications that are designed to let citizens not only receive information but also uh, engage with the city and, and finally if you like around the edge of that you can think of things that are not really run by the city at all but take place within it so that might be uber that might be airbnb <laughs> it might be a smart campus or a smart uh, shopping mall or something like that uh, and, and why are we interested in all this well you know why are we even talking about smart cities well some of this is fairly well trodden ground so i'm not really going to dwell on it too much <laughs> but it's worth saying that um the the cities are at the sharp end of a number of important global trends you know we, you, there are no end of studies from international bodies talking about how this is the the age of the city how the process of urban urbanization is continuing um to gather pace how uh, for the um more and more we are we we have become uh, uh, the, we've become an urban species that's to say for the first time ever more people live in cities than don't we we're still seeing uh huge migration from rural areas uh, and between countries into cities and at the same time particularly in developed countries um, we are seeing the implications of an aging population so citizens are not only full they're increasingly full of old people uh, we can see financial pressures uh, that's um, uh, at two levels first of all you know you, anybody that hasn't been on another planet for the past eight or nine years knows that in most countries of the world there is enormous pressure on public sector finances so uh, governments and cities are being forced to do more with less to somehow make the money that they have got work much harder and at the same time there's a lot of expectations on cities to uh, be engines of regional development and economic growth uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, providing employment but also in terms of uh, attracting business and attracting capital uh, and there is a sense in which cities, cities around the world global cities are seen as competing with each other and then we have the sustainability challenge uh, again if you haven't been on a desert island for the past eight or nine years then you know that uh, we're all facing a tremendous challenge from climate change and resource depletion uh, for cities that's amplified by the problems of air quality and traffic congestion both of which have enormous human and economic effects um, on, on the plus side though there are there are some positive drivers that to some extent make some of this easier uh, to uh, enable to, to make happen we have new connectivity op uh, options 
including lots of short range technologies and some uh, low power wide area technologies for connectivity of which the uh, NBIOT is the latest. We have new um, uh, mechanisms for data collection and data management, you know, what is uh, referred to as big data. We have new analytics tools. And for the first time ever, we have um, a world in which most human beings uh, have a smartphone in their, their pocket, which is both potentially a sensor and an analysis device and also a user interface for the smart city. And we have a number of new um, business and application models. We have uh, cloud and software as a service. We have new kinds of finance models, including vendor financing and public-private uh, partnerships and so on. And we have crowdsourcing, in, both in terms of funding and in terms of data, uh, and, and uh, not forgetting the, the open source uh, software movement. Uh, now, in some ways, uh, cities look like large enterprises. They are the, the, the smart city value chain, the, the smart city supply side, looks a lot like the large enterprise supply side. We see uh, telecoms companies, we see systems integrators, we, say, we see big hardware suppliers and big software suppliers. And to some extent, they address cities as if they were uh, uh, big companies. Uh, but th there's a sense in which cities are different and, and it's, uh, face unique challenges that companies don't face. Yes, a city is a large organization and it's got departments and it's got uh, skill deficits and it's got legacy systems and so on. It's often got multiple systems. Um, they shut off in silos that don't interact properly with each other. And uh, like, a, like an enterprise, a city has a big budget, but unlike a, a, an enterprise, it's often it's got little discretion as to how it can spend that. It's got statutory obligations. It, there are legal things that the city absolutely has to do. So often um, a budget for investment isn't there. A, system, a city has different objectives and metrics to look at to, to, uh, that it must measure up to that uh, it, quite often an enterprise doesn't have to deal with. Um, sometimes it's measured in particular ways by central government. Uh, the, and in, similarly, the people who run the city uh, are usually are elected politicians, and they're answerable not to shareholders who are looking for return on investment, but to voters who don't necessarily think about the city's budget, except when it impacts on them in terms of tax, uh, but do think about the quality of life and the quality of service. And finally, whereas an enterprise often has a relatively well-defined boundary, a, a, a city though it has a formal administrative political boundary on the ground, that the actually people come flooding across that boundary every day. Not many cities have a wall around them that they can control. For the most part, um, the, the, the regional hinterland is part of what the municipal government needs to deal with. Uh, and the the idea of a smart city is, if you like, is, is a moving target. It's something that um, isn't the same today as it was last year. So where when the, the supply side started talking about smart cities, they were often talking about individual point solutions that might have been smart waste or smart traffic controls or um, as you know, smart lighting, which is dear to, to our own hearts at the moment. Um, but those point solutions um, gave way increasingly to talk about a centralized platform. You could realize more of the value from smart city solutions if they would talk to each other, so that if the traffic was doing one thing, you could do such and such a thing with the lighting. Um, uh, and the centralized platform seemed like a really good idea, but it threw up problems of its own. And increasingly now we're looking at a, a more decentralized architecture so that the, the different solutions and the different verticals can, in, can interact with each other, but they don't all have to be hosted and controlled from a single uh, platform. And, and in parallel with that, there's been a, a shift of emphasis from 
the municipality's own operations to interaction with citizens. So it's much more about that kind of happiness agenda now and about getting the citizens to participate. Um, so given all that, why is it important for smart city applications to be open? Well, as we've seen, uh, there is lots of complexity in city applications. Many of them were developed to, um, in isolation on their own, and they were developed to align with the infrastructure that was already there. So a traffic control system would be designed to go with a system of roads and the system of signaling that was already present on the roads, whether that's traffic lights or lighting or whatever. Um, and the waste management system will be designed to go with the existing, uh, if there was one, uh, fleet management system and uh, rostering system <coughs> that the waste disposal uh, department used. Um, so lots and lots of complexity, lots of pre-internet type systems, uh, each with their own proprietary data formats and their proprietary hardware and software. And there's a, a, a strong temptation to a city to go with, a, um, with one platform that can integrate all of those things and, and put it all in a single dashboard that the city administration can look at. And the, the, the temptation is particularly strong when you think of, the, uh, of a, 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 um, a city uh, IT department which may not have a very big budget. The idea that you can go to a supplier and that they're going to give you uh, one solution that will um, enable you to interface with all these things, one, one throat to choke they talk about, and all the problems will be um, hidden under the hood. Uh, so you can see where the temptation is, but it's that there's a lot to be lost from going with a single vendor who is going to lock you into something proprietary and non-standards based. You may lose interoperability between application. Um, you lose economies of scale in future development. You don't, if you're locked into somebody's proprietary solution, you don't get the benefits of a competitive market. Uh, there's less chance of rep replicability, both between what you're doing as a city and what some other city is doing, and replicab replicability between uh, one application and, up and another. And, and, and you lose out on openness for third-party developers. Um, some, some of the cleverest, smartest things that are going on in smart cities uh, were not developed by the city themselves or even by their supplier, but by making uh, data and applications available to third-party suppliers. If you're locked up in a proprietary uh, um, implementation, you may not have that. The, the trouble is that <coughs> everybody talks about openness, um, but one of the things that came through very strongly when we did the study was different parties have different ideas as to what they mean by open. So. Uh, one supplier or one city will talk about the importance of open standards, by which they typically mean, you know, fully open published standards with defined interfaces. Others might mean using open source software, which is really more of a business model than it's a um, it's openness in a technical sense. Others will talk about open data and open data uh, the, the the formats that data are published in, and and. The, the, the full sense and the one that we would say from the study is the most important is about having open APIs uh, which are literally programming interfaces which are standardized even if what's behind them isn't necessarily. Uh, and, and why do we say that rather than standards? Well, um, standards are great in a mature environment uh, where You've got a market that's settled down at, 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 at a, a particular stage in its life cycle. Then the way to ensure interoperability between different offer between different vendors is, is formal standards. No, no two ways about it. In an evolving environment where uh, the technology in the market hasn't settled down, then we're arguing that. Uh, um, 
APIs are a better way to deliver openness than a formal standard. Uh, and we, we argue that smart cities are very much in that stage. The business models are not settled down. The um, models for interconnection between different applications, between different kinds of sensor and, and, and different kinds of connectivity, they're all changing very rapidly at the moment. So an open system is one that can interoperate with other systems via defined interfaces, not necessarily one that conforms to a fully published standard. So um, coming to the end now, uh, there are different models, different options, if you like, for ensuring that one set of applications can uh, interconnect with another. So on the left of our diagram, you, you see uh, the, 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 the single platform uh, architecture. So you have a single dashboard, uh, a, a single connectivity layer, and the applications plug into the connectivity layer and they will um, together plug into that dashboard. Um, and alternatively, the, in the middle, you have a, a vertical oriented approach where essentially you have an anchor application in this case in, in deference to the audience we've got um, a, a smart lighting application that is uh, has its own connectivity and in and and that uh, application connects to the dashboard and the other applications if you like hang off that um, that particular application of the anchor one so the CCTV and the traffic in, in this diagram inter interface not directly to a city platform, but to, uh, to the, the smart lighting application, and, and that is acting as the anchor. <coughs> and um, just for completeness, on the right-hand side of the diagram, we have an intermediate solution uh, uh, displayed, uh, depicted, which shows some applications inter, uh, interacting, interfacing to the dashboard via other applications and some interfacing directly. Um, and each of those has it, their own advantages and disadvantages. The, the, um, the platform type approach is, um, is seen as uh, easier to implement and might be easier to manage because you've got um, you've got a, sing, um, uh, a single uh, supplier to deal with um, but you've also got a single point of failure you've got the risk of lock-in and and frankly it's um, it's, it's very hard to find something like that at the moment uh, and the on the on the vertical uh, type of approach or you you have the downside of of complexity and the the the, the um, potentially diffusion of responsibility, but it is something that you can get. There is no dependency from a single vendor, and you've got more flexibility and less lock in uh, in the in in the immediate present. Uh, and you you of course you've got the opportunity to change your cloud provider or your network provider. So um, those are the options that we 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 we, talk, we looked at in the study, um, and the con the conclusions we came to was that for every city uh, and for every project right now, interoperability should always be a guiding principle. It's something that <laughs> should be baked in from the beginning, uh, but that it's that the city ought to be thinking about forward compatibility with future decisions rather than a, a once and for all platform choice right now. There isn't the one platform to rule them all available at the moment. So what's more, it's more important to think about that future compat compatibility, which um, we think uh, requires flexibility and it requires um, preparation for a future based on uh, open APIs now and open standards in the more distant future. The, the key to remaining flexible right now is uh, interoperability via those APIs. In the long term, 
it's important to choose open and recognized standards. Uh, and at the lower levels of the smart city stack, that's something that makes sense now. But at the higher levels, those standards are not always in present. And where those where recognized standards don't yet exist, the ability to work for APIs is going to be key to guaranteeing openness in the future. So that was my last slide. I'm going to hand back to Peter now, uh, like this. Thanks a lot, Jeremy. So um, thanks, thanks, thanks for this presentation, and of course uh, to the audience. Of course, uh, at the end in our Q and A, you you will be able to to ask uh, Jeremy all kind of of questions concerning this. I now want to hand over to uh, to our vision as, as as Philip's lighting about the smart city, because I think also based on on these findings, how important openness is for the total smart lighting. For us, it is also very important that the vertical, which, will, which we are contributing as Philips and where we are very strong in, 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 the, in, the, in the lighting, that we want to make sure that this uh, lighting vertical is provided in a way where it is very open. And um, the first part is related to the topic on APIs. So from our side, from our side it's very important that the lighting vertical can exchange data with an overall city dashboard or also with other verticals like video surveillance, like traffic management or other applications via these programming interfaces so that the, the data transfer is easily assured and this is completely open and transparent. Another important point for us is the, the kind of network technologies which are used. From our side, it's very important to avoid all kind of proprietary networks because by this, of course, there is a kind of a locking in and there is also a special effort to build up these proprietary networks and to maintain them. So our philosophy is to build on existing networks which are open for everybody to be used and where the most uh, the most available network now in all cities is the mobile phone network. So that's why we are building on the cellular network. In the future, this might also be other networks like Wi-Fi networks and others. But very important, it should always be a professionally managed network which is open for all. And finally, in the way is also how can we assure also our customers um, the, the open choice of components and where it is for us very important that a customer who's to have chosen, uh, chosen for a certain light management system, that this customer is not necessarily obliged then to buy also all the luminaires from this vendor that he can say, I have a certain system, but this system is open to get combined with all kind of possible luminaires. And now coming to this in, in a bit more detail, sorry, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. Yeah. So this is a, a visual explanation of this. So you see in the middle our light management, which is called, uh, which is based on the on the City Touch software platform. So the light management, which on the one side to the left side can interface with all kind of other systems and other data, and on the right side by the mobile connectivity, it can connect to luminaires of all kind of possible vendors. And this openness of the luminaires is depicted here. So we are with our light management system, with our Philip City Touch, we are able to, com uh, to connect with all kind of luminaires. So it can be different technologies. It can be LED technology. It can be conventional technology. It can be a, a park lighting or a highway or a street lighting. And especially important, it can be luminaires of all kind of vendors. We have a so-called City Touch Ready Partner Program, and every luminaire vendor is invited to participate in this program. 
so that the city has the full flexibility to choose the luminaires of their choice, which all can be combined with City Touch. The other important part is now to exchange data with other applications. And here, for example, as an example, you see here two different verticals, which are of which are of course of 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 of, of same importance and which are in in a way both existing in a smart city. One example is a security application where with, with video cameras, for example, you are observing certain events in the city. And the other one is then your street lighting. And here, the symbol in the middle is uh, depicting the APIs so that you can do it in a way that certain events or certain data observed by the video surveillance system can by a data and command exchange with the street lighting system trigger then certain light settings. So that, and this is only an example, you could of course think now about other verticals like for example, traffic manage, uh, measurements or, or other topics. And all of these, they can exchange data via open APIs and can then influence each other. And it is the city who at the end is building up all these verticals, all with a kind of different timing depending on the needs of the city. But it's also the city who can decide via these APIs which kind of information they want to connect with each other. And finally, finally in many cities, there is interest in an in a overall dashboard. And uh, under this overall dashboard, you have then all kind of different lighting uh, application verticals. Here again, the street lighting, but also security and traffic. And all these have a direct interface with the city dashboard. I think in the example of the verticals, which, which uh, Jeremy was using, he was still using the, the example of an anchor. But in this case, I think we would go even further in the openness that every vertical directly goes to the dashboard. So the dashboard has a direct connection to every vertical to trigger uh, and to monitor certain performance param parameters, but also to have, for example, exchange of asset information from the overall city dashboard to all verticals, so that you have information exchange of every vertical with the overall city dashboard. And this is, of course, also an area where the number of applications will grow over time. And the city has the possibility to build up all these applications and to all connect them to a city dashboard. If we now try to combine all this in one picture, then you see on the top there is the city dashboard. Below, there are certain application areas. Every application area has via APIs and data exchange with the city dashboard, but the different application verticals also have data exchange between each other that they can mutually influence their settings, where, for example, traffic management or video surveillance can trigger certain light settings. And finally, the light management system is a system which is the end-to-end -end control system, system, but it can then be combined with all kinds of different luminaires of all kinds of different vendors. So this is the way how we see the light management as an important application area for a smart city, fully embedded in an ecosystem where especially via APIs, there is a continuous data exchange which can also be built up and always adapted to new applications being added to it. So where the city keeps the full flexibility to have this data exchange and to really make the city smart. A, an example where we have realized this is the, the city of Buenos Aires where the city of Buenos, Buenos Aires is using Sapana as a city dashboard and where we have our light management, which is controlling the, the street lighting of the total city, where we have 
uh, we have combined our city touch management system with this Sapana dashboard, which are continuously exchanging data. So this is one of the examples uh, where we have this built up. We also have other examples. Now, I first of all want to thank you for your attention and 